Frank Danuki, President and CEO of Marine and Mike Mansfield Foundation, is his life career, career specialist. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be back in Seoul. I was here last month, and I'll be coming back next month. So I think maybe I should get myself an apartment um, for all the visits that I'll be making uh, to Korea. Uh, and thanks especially to uh, President Lee Sok Jong, uh, the East Asia Institute, and Minister uh, Ryu Gil Jae uh, for their remarks this morning. Uh, over lunch, we heard, uh, some of us heard, reflections from Ambassador Lee Hong-gu about the long tortured history of efforts at Korean unification and denuclearization over the last um, 70 years. Uh, and I was reminded of a meeting that I had with President Carter in 1994, just prior to his visit to Pyongyang uh, to meet with Kim Il-sung. Uh, I was part of a team of briefers at the State Department who were supposed to remind President Carter about what had happened in North Korea since he was president. And he and his wife, Rosalind Carter, uh, sat through nine hours of briefings from State Department experts. And I was the final briefer, so he was tired. Uh, and he asked for a Coca-Cola, and someone brought him a Pepsi. And of course, he could not drink Pepsi because his home state of Georgia was the headquarters of Coca-Cola. So he refused the Pepsi, and eventually someone found a Coca-Cola for him, and then I could proceed with my briefing. And at the end of my briefing, all of the briefers came to, to the room for a wrap-up session. And President Carter turned to us and he said, none of you have told me what I need to know. And we all looked at the floor, <laughs> ashamed, he says, I need to know, what does Kim Il-sung want? Now, Carter was a smart politician. And again, we all looked at the floor and pretended that we were not in the room because none of us could answer his question. So finally, President Carter turned to us and he said, I'll tell you what Kim Il-sung wants. Kim Il-sung wants my respect, and I'm going to give it to him. Now, I, I was reminded of this story by Ambassador Lee because much has changed in East Asia over the last 20 years, uh, but something has not changed, uh, which is that the, the DPRK remains a country in search of respect. And unfortunately for all of us, uh, the DPRK leadership does not behave in a way that often gives us reason to show them respect. Um, and somehow bridging this dilemma is a part of the challenge we face in unification and also in coordination among the other powers. Uh, I won't summarize my paper. You've got my thoughts on some of the core questions in front of you, but let me make just a couple of key points. Uh, one is that the situation in Northeast Asia is extremely fluid. It, it is dynamic. It is not static. Uh, things are changing and changing rapidly with the rise of China, uh, growing nationalism in, in South Korea, Japan, and China, um, with uh, changes in North Korea in leadership, um, uh, and changes in the economic fundamentals of East Asia, where you do have much more intra-Asia trade. But I agree with Professor Fujiwara that that trade by itself does not guarantee any uh, significant improvements in the security relationship. So it's a very fluid situation, and it's also one made more uncertain by the United States, because although the United States has announced a policy of rebalancing to Asia, and I'm sure uh, the architect of that policy, Kurt Campbell, will give us his thoughts tomorrow, um, in my judgment, uh, the rebalance is largely uh, a blank check without much in the way of resources. Um, and I think that the combination of some lofty rhetoric, but some very uh, uh, meager resources, 
uh, has further uh, destabilized people's perceptions of the United States' commitment to East Asia. And East Asia is a region that is uh, lacking in effective multilateral institutions. So again, I commend the East Asia Institute for thinking multilaterally, but the reality is that the only security structures that matter in East Asia right now are the United States hub and spoke security system. And the problem there, as many in this room know, and as Professor Fujiwara knows, is that some of the spokes are broken, the wheel is bent, um, um, and communication among some of the U.S. core allies, especially Korea and Japan, uh, has broken down. Uh, and so we are at a difficult time. In the midst of all of this, we're here to talk about unification and what it might mean for the region. Uh, for sure, unification of the Korean Peninsula might pose new challenges, but I think we should view it mostly as an opportunity. Uh, the United States truly would welcome unification. I think there are some friends I have in Seoul who have long doubted whether the United States su truly supports unification of the Korean Pen Peninsula. Let me put your minds to rest. We do, on a bipartisan basis, Democrats and Republicans welcome the prospect of Korean unification. Uh, the United States does not need an excuse to maintain forces on the Korean Peninsula. Um, we are here uh, not uh, as an expansion of American imperial ambition, uh, but as a guarantor of regional peace and security. Uh, and unification of the Korean Peninsula would be a most welcome uh, development uh, for the American people and the American government. I think China increasingly would welcome unification. I think this represents a change in China's views. I believe that in the past, China viewed North Korea as a buffer state, a very valuable insulation between China and the West and the U.S. treaty ally, South Korea. I, I no longer think that the, the key leadership in China uh, puts much value on having a buffer state, especially if that buffer state is an impoverished, destabilizing, a dangerous North Korea. Um, and I think Chinese pragmatism will overtake ideology in Chinese thinking about the prospects of unification if and when unification looks achievable. Japan, uh, I won't speak for Japan. Uh, Fujiwara-san has given you some important insights into Japan's thinking. Um, I would say that I think the, the role of the abduction issue uh, is very powerful in Tokyo. Uh, I had the honor of meeting with Prime Minister Abe when he was Chief Cabinet Secretary under Prime Minister Koizumi in 2004. I had just come back from North Korea, and I had met there with uh, Song Il-ho, uh, the DPRK official responsible for the Japanese relationship, and I briefed Chief Cabinet Secretary Abe on the results of my meeting, and uh, I was struck by his passionate, personal, deep commitment on this issue. Uh, and I will not forget that meeting, uh, which made a big impression on me. Uh, and we'll hear about Russia's views about unification. I would say that perhaps no country um, has a greater stake, uh, and it's a bit ironic, uh, in the successful resolution of the division of the Korean Peninsula than does Russia, because peace and security in Northeast Asia is part of the, the key that unlocks uh, the peaceful development of the Russian Far East and its integration into the incredibly globally dynamic economic region of East Asia. Uh, so uh, when you start to think about uh, train loads full of South Korean products making their way across Russia to Europe uh, and to Russia itself, uh, when you think about the uh, ability of Russian energy and gas resources to flow peacefully uh, through the Korean Peninsula to Korea, to China, to Japan, um, uh, Russia could be a big winner uh, from uh, unification or at least peaceful coexistence between North and South. Um, so I think that the international forces are actually aligned favorably uh, to support Korean unification in a way that they have not been for much of the, se the last 70 years. I think the, the, the powers around the DPRK are more in alignment today than ever 
around the prospects of peaceful unification. Um, the obstacles are well known to us, um, um, but we should summon some encouragement from the fact that the great powers are not at odds with one another as much as they used to be over the prospect of Korean unification. Finally, uh, let me just say that uh, uh, I do worry a little bit about Washington. Uh, I should give you a perspective briefly from Washington. Uh, the Obama administration's uh, approach to Korea has become known as a shorthand uh, strategic patience. And I think the danger is that this becomes strategic indifference. Right? Uh, the United States has a lot on its plate right now. My former bosses, Secretary Biden, uh, excuse me, Vice President Biden and Secretary Kerry, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sad to report to you uh, that when they get up in the morning, uh, the Korean situation is not number one on their agenda. It's probably not number two or three or even number four. Right? This is a strategic reality of the United States uh, conflict in the Middle East, uh, difficult relations with Russia, uh, uh, difficult uh, economic recovery tasks still left unfinished at home, um, and difficult nuclear negotiations not with the DPRK but with Iran. All of these issues are more prominent in the minds of my, my former bosses than the Korean Peninsula. I don't want a crisis on the Korean Peninsula to put it back on the front pages, but uh, we need to summon greater energy out of Washington to participate uh, in a multilateral <coughs> regional effort to engage the DPRK on human rights, on the nuclear issue, uh, on economic uh, uh, issues, uh, if we're going to really see a solution. Uh, I agree with uh, Minister Ru this morning that uh, North-South relations, this is the core of the solution to the Korean Peninsula, uh, but we should not fool ourselves. Uh, Washington uh, is a, a vital partner in the process, and if Washington is absent, uh, then I think the prospects of uh, significant uh, uh, progress on the task of unification and preparing for it uh, will become much bleaker. So I hope that uh, uh, the new team uh, being assembled in Washington and here in Seoul uh, will breathe fresh energy into U.S. engagement uh, on the Korean Peninsula. Thanks so much. For your presentation, uh, Zanussi showed us a good picture of East Asia's changing regional order and Korean unification issues from the U.S. perspective. Our third speaker will be uh, Vasily McKeith, Vice President, Institute of World Economy and International Relations. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I try briefly to answer the questions raised by organizers of the conference. The first <coughs> point is about East Asia regional architecture. My main point is that uh, the current system of global governance is losing its power. It's true in regard to Asia Pacific as well. I mean that the current Asia Pacific security architecture uh, fails to solve the main security problems of the area, like North Korea and North Korean missile program, uh, problem, uh, territorial disputes, uh, security of navigation, political destabilization in some countries, uh, and uh, so on. Uh, the growth of tension in Russia-U.S. relations because of uh, uh, the Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian uh, situation deteriorates uh, the uh, security order in the world and in Asia Pacific. But in my view, the influence of the Ukrainian crisis on Europe is much uh, bigger than on the situation in Asia Pacific. Besides it, Russia and the United States have many uh, common security interests in different spheres, uh, beginning from uh, the strategic stability, uh, uh, control over uh, nuclear weapons, and uh, <coughs> ending with uh, uh, combating uh, terrorism and uh, uh, stopping proliferation on, 
of uh, weapons of mass mass destruction. So, uh, my uh, point is that in despite of the Ukrainian crisis, Russia and uh, the United Russia remains the player in Asia Pacific area and uh, Russia American relations as well as relations between Russia and uh, other countries uh, have a big potential for making peace in this area uh, stronger. My second point is about implications of uh, Korean unification on the situation. Uh, it's very important. I asked this question uh, in the morning to Mr. Uh, unification Minister, but um, it is very important for me to underline that uh, the only realistic way of unification is absorption of the North by the South on the market democracy principles of the Republic of Korea. I cannot understand any other variant of the uh, solving uh, the unification issue. So, if it is true that Korean unification will bring to East Asia security and cooperation both new ch chances and new challenges. The main chances First of all, lay in economy. <clears throat> there are deeper involvement of the unified Korea into regional cooperation, better prospects for Northeast Asia free trade area idea, elimination of the main threat to regional security that currently is North Korean regime and the North Korean nucle nuclear uh, program. I think that after the unification on the market democracy principles, the nuclear uh, pro uh, problem of North Korea will be solved automatically. Uh, it also means better environment for solving other political and security uh, problems of the region, better environment for normal humanitarian contacts in the region. Uh, but also we, we can uh, face new challenges. Uh, they, uh, first of all, uh, cover political and security spheres. After the North Korean problem is solved, the role and security meaning of other pending issues will grow up territorial and historical disputes, competition for leadership, etc. Moreover, the North Korean nuclear problem made the region more united because all the countries were interested, uh, were uh, against the nuclear North Korea. After the unification, this uniting the countries factor will disappear. And I think that the region will need a new agenda for providing new environment for security and cooperation. And in my view, it is reasonab uh, reasonable to start to think in advance about and to work out a new post-North Korea agenda for building up regional security and cooperation architecture. My next point is about how unification will influence upon U.S.-China relations. From my point of view, I think that China-U.S. Uh, relations have its own logic of development and uh, they will uh, depend uh, more upon whether uh, both countries succeed or not in a construction of relationship of a new type rather than on what happens on the Korean uh, Peninsula. Uh, the next point about how the unification uh, influences upon uh, uh, Russia. The main Russian concerns, first, American military infrastructure will move close to Russian border. Under the current crisis of Russia, America, American relations uh, because of Ukraine, this concern becomes stronger. Second, Russia will lose economic competition to China on the markets of the unified Korea. Third, South Korea will be preoccupied with financial assistance to the northern part of the unified Korea, and South Korean investment in Russian economy can slow down. And uh, finally, there are some voices in Russia that the unified Korea will continue North Korean nuclear program. Uh, in my view, it's uh, uh, impossible because Seoul, in my eyes, is a responsible uh, nuclear power. The main Russian concerns include the unification will, uh, not concerns, already I talked about concerns, now expectations. Uh, first, the unification will bring more security to the Korean Peninsula and Northeast Asia, including Russian Far East. That's true. Second, the unification will automatically solve the North Korean nuclear threat. Third, in the long run, unification will open new opportunities for economic integration in Northeast Asia with new chances for Russia. 
although in the short run it can limit Korean investment in Russian uh, Far East and in Russia. Frank, uh, Frank asked me about uh, asked me a, a question. So my answer is that uh, uh, Russian main security interests nowadays are in the uh, post-Soviet uh, area, where uh, Russian uh, leadership pretends to be the main player. That's why uh, it very uh, nervously reacts to uh, when Americans, as Moscow, uh, thinks uh, interferes in uh, relations. Uh, but economic, so, uh, and not in East Asia. <coughs> but economic interest in Asia, uh, economic interest to Asia, which now is stronger than before because of uh, sanction, sanction war, uh, is focused on China. Oh, first of all. So, uh, finally, about the future of the architecture. I think that two main principles uh, should be uh, reasonably put into the basis of creation of this new architecture. Uh, it is uh, first that the world is polycentric, and the second, the, should be the world is uh, hierarchic. So there is, uh, I mean that there is a hierarchy of powers and responsibility in the area. And uh, countries with more power should, uh, uh, should, have, should carry more responsibility for, uh, the, uh, for the situation. So, uh, and uh, the third principle is that uh, um, uh, in the prism of responsibility and uh, uh, power, um, uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, uh, power, it should be a network of the countries. But in terms of responsibilities, a pyramid. As I said, uh, countries with more power are more responsible for the development of the area. Against this background, uh, let me uh, propose a couple of uh, ideas which can help now in short run and medium term run uh, to help uh, to, uh, to continue to create new architecture. First, I think it's necessary to continue six-party talks even if uh, North Korea doesn't want to participate. <coughs> Five uh, participants of six-party talk, talks uh, minus North Korea uh, should closely coordinate the efforts at the sessions of the fifth working group. By the way, Russia is uh, a chair of this group. And uh, this process is aimed to discuss security in Northeast Asia. North Korea participation is not necessary. So if they don't want to come, okay, we have what to discuss. Joint uh, approach to North Korea plus new secu security architecture in Northeast Asia. Second idea is to strengthen efforts to build confidence and develop cooperation within and between regional multilateral uh, networks. As far as American alliances are concerned, uh, we offer to promote dialogue of key defenses alliances, I mean, dialogue, uh, and Russia and China, I mean dialogues between US, Japan, and US and South Korea, alliances with Russia, and US, Japan, US, South Korea alliances uh, with China, similar to what Russia has uh, with NATO. Because you see, even, even uh, in the situation of the Ukrainian crisis, Russia contacts with NATO uh, do continue. And finally, I think it's important to officially involve government specialists in the expert discussions and promote the dialogue using the 1.5 track format. And uh, that's, uh, uh, that's what uh, our Korean um, friends are doing now. And that's why I think that this current Korean uh, conference organized by our Korean colleagues uh, is uh, very and uh, very important. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miki. As each presentation goes one by one, I think we are now having a little bit more thick colored pictures of the emerging regional structure in this arena and also the uh, diverse meaning of Korean unification issues. The final uh, presentation will be given by Dr. Li Nan, Research Fellow of Chinese Academy of Social Science. Please. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thanks the East Asia Institute for having me here. 
and I'm very happy to share my view on Korean unification. I'm looking forward to hearing your comments and views. So from, uh, from Chinese view, uh, the geopolitical structure of the East Asia still remain a Cold War state, uh, chiefly because of the uh, Korean division. Uh, despite the highly dynamic and uh, profound social economic developments and the transformations throughout the region. Under the circumstance of the, the zero game, the zero sum game in the region, uh, whether a united Korea will meaningful uh, alter the geopolitic landscape in the Northeast Asia is becoming a big concern from China. There's no doubt that China support a one-state political solution, viewing peninsula current division as a historical and an anonym anomaly. Uh, China's official stance and interests are clear to define uh, the current China's um, policy uh, envision a durable peace on the peninsula, which leads to peaceful unification on the principle of self-determination, which is mean no foreign force should interfere with the process of unification. So although the clarification put China in a pro-unification cap, I personally think China envision for Korean unification will more focus on how to achieve the unification uh, than the unica unification itself. Currently in China, the opinion and conclusion and the recommendations on Korean unification uh, with, with chorus of the academic diplomats and the strategists in China reflect growing divided views. Uh, some Chinese experts uh, support a unified Korea as a peaceful, independent, uh, uh, even neutral nation. However, some Chinese uh, experts doubt a united Korea would be into uh, the U.S. audit. China, should, uh, China would be cautious about any potential conflict with U.S. in the peninsula. Concerning China's stance and uh, behavior in reaction to any scenario that would produce a reunified Korea, I think China, ROK, and other parties should keep close engagement, share, share information, and coordinate pace during the process. For decades, China has kept its consistent principles of no war and no chaos at the Korean Peninsula, opposing any military interpretation, uh, provo provocation and interpretation from both sides. Uh, China, China agrees that un unification is Korean issue, uh, but actually, uh, so in this year, uh, Chinese Foreign Minister for Affairs uh, uh, expressed their concerns on the military exercise run by ROK and the uh, um, United States. It's shown China disapprove not only nuclear program run by DPRK, but also the military exercise by US and ROK. It's clear that China is very much concerned to the alliance uh, between ROK and US. For my paper, I, ra I raised uh, several questions about possible scenario of the unification run by ROK. Uh, first one, will the U US military cross 38th parallel? And second, will the United States establish new bases north of the 38th parallel? Uh, th third, will the US forces on the peninsula transfer operation uh, control of the ROK, leaving it to take action in the north by themselves. Uh, fourth, will the international organization such as UN, IEA, IEA uh, etc., get involvement of the unification process? Such concerns are really to are related to the China's principles on Korean Peninsula. If if they could be addressed very well. China, ROK, and US could build confidence, and also the China, Chinese domestic audience could be persuaded that Chinese position in Korea will, is still secure. Secondly, Chinese uh, believe uh, a Korean reunified and the most plausible scenarios further the strategic interest of, of only the United States and ROK. Uh, once the status, st 
status quo is broken, uh, China would like to settle dispute with the uh, United Korea in order to strengthen its relationship. This issue probably include uh, first one, uh, Korea's clarification of the position on whether U.S. military presence would remain on the peninsula when unification is achieved. The key question is important for China's uh, Chinese who are reluctant to believe a uh, reun reunified Korea under sore control uh, and the lacking of DPRK's threat would immediately oust U.S. forces and the inherent North arsenal become, becomes a strategic concern related to the core interest of, of China. A handful of reassurance from uh, Korea could associate many Beijing's concerns. And second, a united Korea would settle some dispute with uh, issue with China, such as territory dispute, uh, about such as Kendo, uh, Yalu River estuary, northern uh, fishing boat. And third, a united Korea would engage with China on the economic development in order to strengthen up uh, uh, economic tie with China. From Chinese perspective, reunification implies reconstruction that could improve economic uh, situation in the North, as well as job creation necessary to keep China's three provinces development. Uh, so China's will be positive on the re re reconstruction of the North and the enlargement of the trade with the South. Uh, certainly, I think the Korean relief will be another important issue China will concern. So I think there's a little certainty regarding Korean unification, and it's hard to predict future developments too absolute concerning China's stance apparent. Uh, however, first, the Chinese think to manage the process and take a very uh, active way uh, role on the peninsula. And second, domestic opinion and the suspicion toward U.S. ROK intention will condition Chinese thinking and options. It's highly possible that the reunification position of China and the U.S. ROK can ultimately reach a consensus uh, as long as all party uh, high-level political, economic, military engagement, including increasing the strategic trust between China and the U.S., uh, elevated fears and the correct misconception. Thank you. Uh, maybe for more years, then, should we be prepared to have a North Korea policy rather than unification policy? So are we prepared for that? Are we prepared to cope with any challenges coming from Kim Jong-un's North Korea who may survive uh, for quite extensive time. And uh, in related to the how, how do you evaluate South Korea's North Korea policy? Because we've talked about unification, but not really about North Korea's policy. So, uh, and I think our government should be prepared for that uh, as well. So do you think uh, our government is pursuing some kind of sound North Korea policy? Uh, if we lack something, then uh, what's your advice for that? Uh, that's the common uh, question. Uh, four different questions to Japan. Uh, it was very clear that uh, Professor Fujiwara talked about Japan's uh, approach to North Korea. And I know that Japanese uh, negotiators are quite materialistic. They have dealt with North Korea for many years. So I don't have any doubt that Japan will fail to deal with North Korea. Uh, but as you said, uh, there is some uh, lack of linkage between abduction issue and overall North Korea issue. Then, do you have, uh, as I like, as I said, do you do you have some North Korea policy, long-term North Korea policy, which is related to the, your policy for uh, Korean Peninsula? Because do you think uh, the challenge from Japan will be very important in the future, and that in that sense, uh, the space of Korea Peninsula will be strategically more important in the future. So you should have your own regional policy rather than abduction issue. So how do you uh, look at this abduction issue from which kind of regional strategy of, of your administration? Uh, second to the states, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Janucci was very clear about uh, the current U.S. policy toward North Korea. It was very help uh, helpful. 
uh, so strategic impatience or strategic indifference. Uh, but we cannot continue that. If North Korea succeeds in developing long-range missiles, for example, then it will be a game changer. You know, you should be uh, dealing with North Korea in any way in the future. So how do you predict uh, the remaining two years of Obama administration or the next president's uh, North Korea policy? And how important will North Korea issue in uh, the maybe coming presidential election in two years uh, to Russia? Uh, I think if Kim Jong-un picks up the uh, country to visit, maybe Russia will be one very good candidate because, you know, among the four surrounding countries, uh, North Korea may think Russia is most favorable to uh, North Korea. So uh, do you have some policy measures uh, to North Korea to persuade them uh, to make some strategic decisions of denuclearization or come to the uh, policy of reform and opening. So how, how uh, do you perceive uh, the current North Korea and what's your uh, policy uh, toward North Korea? Uh, lastly, China, uh, you talked about unification. So every South Koreans, I think, are wondering about uh, most desirable scenario to China about unified Korea. Uh, you talked about uh, the future alliance status of unified Korea, uh, definitely you wouldn't like a unified Korea with strong uh, U.S.-South Korea alliance. Uh, so what's your uh, vision? Uh, because you support one Korea, you're a divided country as ours, so maybe you will support a uh, unified Korea in terms of, you know, ideal. Uh, but what kind of uh, unified Korea do you like most? If you said buffer, uh, if South Korea, I mean, unified Korea uh, become a buffer, then every surrounding country should not wield, you know, power upon Korea because you should respect the state of buffer, you know, as a, some kind of neutral zone. So are you willing to uh, respect that kind of you know, uh, arrangement if there is unification? Thank you. To be answered, uh, I would like to invite the Professor James Cotton of University of South Wales as a second commentator. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Hahn. Thank you to the Institute for their very kind uh, invitation to participate. In this session, we're invited to consider the question of regional order. Talking about order is always difficult because it's an ambiguous concept. It's an ambiguous concept in English. You can talk about a random order being a series that just has characteristics of the characteristics that are out there but also you can talk about order as opposed to disorder well l listening to the four presentations I, uh, I just uh, listened to and reading the papers also I thought carefully about what kind of order the speakers were telling us about and if you consider some of their key terms fluidity indifference uncertainty I think the kind of order we're talking about is one that has no real coherence. And so the job of uh, any kind of discussion of policy is to see what kind of coherence can be imposed, what's, what's possible and what's not. So I have questions about possibilities to each of the, each of the speakers in, in, in this light. I must say partly informed by the, the wonderful lunchtime talk given by a pro a Professor Hongku Lee who reminded us that there were times in the past when the two careers were quite close to some kind of arrangement and perhaps we ought to go back to that time and, and reconsider those principles as a basis for moving forward. To Professor Fujiwara, his basic point is the abduction issue trumps the nuclear issue. Now historically I can see why that has been the case. I can also see why any Japanese government would be concerned about the welfare of its citizens. But I wonder whether the Japanese government can maintain that position. Maybe in the Abe regime this will be the case. But if North Korea tests further nuclear devices, if the North Koreans are successful in weaponizing their nuclear system in a, in a credible kind of way, could Japan be indifferent? Could Japan remain indifferent? Bearing in mind, of course, that the North Koreans for many years have threatened to attack Japan in the event of any kind of conflict in, in Northeast Asia, whether Japan is a party or not. They've said this many, many times. 
So I wonder whether that, uh, that situation will persist. Well, of course, in confronting this issue and in confronting the uh, North Korean nuclear issue and perhaps even going back to the six party talks, although I've got reservations about that as the vehicle, there must come a time when Seoul and Tokyo will have to talk on these and other issues. Uh, surely that's the next step that has to be taken and I can see why currently relations are poor but I can't see how Japanese national interest is served by any long-term persistence in these estranged relations. These are two, two parties that have to get together if this issue is to be confronted. What do we have to do to see some progress? And that's what I'd like to hear from Professor Fujiwara. Um, I was extremely interested to uh, hear the comments from uh, Mr. Genuzzi. I was very surprised to learn that he's a skeptic on the, the Asian rebalance. Uh, I can see the, 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 the grounds for that. In fact, what we're seeing is, in, on the part of the United States, a rebalance towards the Middle East, which started in 2001 and has just gone into its second phase, and I think it's got a, a long way to run. Um, in his paper, to some extent also in his remarks, I was a little bit concerned by his suggestion that the only really sure and safe and reliable security system in the region is the hub and spokes model, even given its current problems. In his paper, he says, in fact, while there is no regional NATO, it would be helpful to have such a thing because it would reassure weaker powers. And he also argues the case for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. He suggests that perhaps other parties might become involved, including even the Chinese, although there I think I have a, a difference with him. Uh, my point, my question to him really is, if we assume that the biggest regional player is the People's Republic of China, if we assume that the Chinese are not going to go away anywhere, if we assume that the conditions of the TPP are not uh, found amenable to the, by the Chinese, and I suspect that they, they won't be under current conditions, surely we need a, a different approach that puts China front and center in this region. It's, it's fruitless to try and reanimate um, um, the hub and spoke system to uh, confront the Chinese because they are now far too big and important uh, player uh, for this to be sustainable. And of course, without a pragmatic Chinese approach, and I agree with you there, there's no solution to the uh, Korean nuclear question and there's no progress on Korean unification. I, I very much enjoyed uh, um, Dr. McKeeve's paper. I thought it was interestingly and refreshingly forward-looking, and I would agree with him particularly of this idea of polycentrism. But the idea of polycentrism seems to me to entail respecting the validity of the parties who happen to be out there. And whether we like it or not, the DPRK is a regional party. And whether we like it or not, any discussion of reunification must involve the DPRK as an interlocutor. You have to talk to somebody about reunification. There's no other government in Pyongyang. It's the government in Pyongyang you've got to talk to. So if you say that unification can only proceed on the basis of uh, market principles, then I wonder how much progress you'll make. The point is, in talking to the DPRK, you have first to uh, do a careful analysis of the interests of your interlocutors. And the people who run North Korea at the present time are not going to be very pleased to hear that they will be supplanted by new market actors. This is simply not a realistic policy. So I wonder whether in implementing a policy, uh, polycentric uh, approach, uh, perhaps uh, we are going to have to take the North Koreans a great deal more seriously uh, than, we, than we do. I have very little disagreement with, um, with Dr. Lee, um, although like many Chinese spokespersons, it's curious to me that Dr. Lee doesn't mention the fact that China still has a security alliance with the DPRK. Uh, as far as I'm aware, this alliance was formed in September 1961. It's gone through many, many permutations, but it's still in existence. And surely, in, in regional terms, it must be enormously reassuring to the people in Pyongyang to know 
that in the event of any kind of aggressive action on the peninsula, the Chinese will come to their rescue, and so must constitute a major component in any security analysis of Northeast Asia, that Chinese spokespersons these days seem to have forgotten that that alliance uh, is in existence. I would like to know from him exactly what its status is and what it contributes to the current set of arrangements. And in the event of a Korean unification, would he expect that alliance still to be in existence? or would he expect it to be renegotiated? So those are, those are my questions. What I'm, what I'm, uh, in, in each case, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to think forward to the current, as we see, flu fluid and uncertain and indifferent situation to something a little more constructive. But I think the, the common principles that I would like to see operate is taking seriously all the players who are there in the room, and this certainly includes the People's Republic of China, and it certainly includes whether we like it or not, the DPRK. Thank you very much. Thank you. As the staff of the EAI is now collecting the comments and questions from the floor, if you have, please give it over to the staff of the EAI. Our last designated commentator will be Dean Barry Desker. The School of International Studies, Nanyang Technological University. Please. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think the two discussions before me have raised a host of questions uh, for the panelists. Instead of trying to add to a series uh, of questions to them, uh, what I'd like to do is provide a, a number of thoughts which could provide the background for their own thinking. The first issue is the whole question uh, of the Northeast Asian or East Asian uh, architecture. Uh, I think there is a clear sense that uh, what we have today is a flexible, uh, uh, fluid, or in James Cotton's terms, uh, a non coherent architecture. But the, I think the key point is that East Asia needs to develop a workable architecture which facilitates regional growth and stability. This is really the uh, issue that we are facing. And the question is, what is the kind of architecture? Wh how will it look like? Uh, I think uh, underlying this is the premise that the United States and China have to develop an equilibrium which both can accept. Uh, in this context, uh, the uh, argument of establishing a NATO, as uh, Frank Yanuzi has suggested, or continuation of the hub and spokes uh, uh, structure is something which is a reality. But I'd like also to uh, highlight that we have a mirror image. China has alliance relationships with uh, uh, both the DPRK and Pakistan, as well as partnership arrangements with countries like uh, Myanmar, Cambodia, and Laos. So it is not the United States alone which has an, uh, uh, an alliance structure in the region. The second observation I would make uh, is that uh, the discussion has focused on Korean uh, unification. But it appears to have done so uh, on, uh, on the basis that this would occur on terms determined by the South Korea. But I, I, I would like to suggest that perhaps there may be alternatives. What if merger leads to North Korean values shaping a reunified Korea? What would it mean? Would we be having the emergence of a de facto China-Korea alliance with increasing hostility towards Japan and the end of an alliance re uh, relationship with the United States. In those circumstances, will the United States retreat from the region? After all, there has been talk of a pivot, of a rebalancing to Asia. Effectively, uh, 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 Secretary of Defense uh, uh, at the 2012 uh, Shangri-La Dialogue said that it would mean a 60-40 deployment of the Navy to uh, 
uh, Pacific waters instead of the 50-50 uh, deployment. However, I would argue that in the light of uh, what is occurring in the Middle East with the rise of ISIL and uh, with the uh, issues in the Ukraine which have uh, raised concerns about security once again uh, in Europe, uh, it is unsure whether rebalancing in the way that it was originally conceived will take place. A second uh, point in, in connection with the issue of uh, unification is the cost of absorbing North Korea. It will be much more expensive, uh, the cost will be much higher than that of absorbing uh, East Germany into a reunified Germany. One estimate that I've seen is that there will be an 8% annual transfer of GDP to the north for 10 years, or if it's done at a slower pace, 3% of GDP uh, over 30 years. The question would be, would the people of South Korea accept a lower sta increase in their standard of living in order to accommodate uh, the redistribution to North Korea? Perhaps I reflect my own biases here. I come uh, from Singapore, which uh, in the early 60s was part of the Federation of Malaysia. In 1965, we had separation from Malaysia. Depending on where you stood politically, you would say that we were kicked out of Malaysia or we seceded from Malaysia. Today, after 50 years, I would argue that separation has turned to divorce. So the question I would pose is, if we take a 10-year view on the, issues, uh, on the issue of unification, is it much more likely that a two-state solution is more likely to occur than uh, unification? I, I come to this view partly because uh, my uh, institution, the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, uh, as, uh, uh, for example, this year, a North Korean student. And, and there are also North Korean students doing MBAs, uh, MPAs in Singapore. The, uh, and what I've found is that uh, you have a realist, pragmatic elite aware of the world beyond North Korea. Uh, and, and the assumption we have uh, is that this is a collapsing regime may be one that we may be forced to reconsider. Are we prepared to reconsider and, con and work on the possibility that despite the fact that we disagree with the nature of that regime, that regime may continue to exist? Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to give a chance to the uh, speakers to respond to the comments from three designated discussants. I would like to start the order in the reversal order. How about Dr. Lee, would you give response to the comments? And uh, actually for the first question about the North Korean uh, situation, uh, I just went there uh, twice this year and uh, uh, in this August, I went to Rasen and to visit the, the economic zone. Uh, actually, I think the economic situation is quite good. Uh, people, they are talking about the economic uh, development too much. And uh, so I can feel either in Pyongyang and Rasen, uh, there are the people there are really eager to talking about, uh, talk about the economic improvement. Uh, the possibility for the for the uh, North Korean regime, uh, if there's a big change, and I'm a little, little bit free, worry about the influential inflow. So uh, I think this is a, a exchange. This is a change. Uh, North Korea never exchange. If too much information flew to the society, um, probably the the uh, North Korean. Uh, official or the party cannot handle it very well. So they are eager to find a way to 
uh, to deal with uh, this information. So uh, this year in Rodong Ximen, um, they talk about the China's uh, management on internet. So they say this is uh, the praise of this management of the internet. Uh, so I think if they want to uh, change their uh, information environment, probably China is the one they can learn from. And this, this is the first, second, first question. And the second question, and uh, uh, I think the buffer zone theory in China well, is a really old theory. And, uh, and the people, uh, Chinese experts uh, in, in Beijing, um, very few people talk about this uh, buffer zone theory anymore. And uh, uh, they, we, uh, for my personal view, uh, the ideal state for United Korea could be like uh, Korea, sh uh, no military alliance in the Korean Peninsula. But if the reality is that United States will be here, the Korean Peninsula, then I think China and the United States and the uh, ROK should talk about this. And uh, uh, um, we should negotiate and uh, uh, have a serious engagement on this issue. Uh, about the military alliance with uh, DPRK, uh, I think, yes, there's a treaty between China and D DPRK. But uh, since 2000, I don't, I don't think any military uh, real cooperation between China and DPRK. We have no uh, any mini military exercise with DPRK. And uh, there's uh, very few military operation between China and DPRK. So uh, and that's why I think the alliance, or we don't call them alliance. According to the uh, Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we said our relationship with D DPRK is a normal state <coughs> so relationship. So uh, control, uh, actually, uh, we are defend this uh, relationship uh, already. Uh, so I think uh, China want to uh, have a good relationship with uh, either South Korea or North Korea. That's why we can see uh, when Xi Jinping sent the, the telegram for congratulating DPRK's national, they said uh, both countries should cherish friendship, older generation build. And also when, when Xi Jinping uh, visit South Korea, uh, they said uh, pa President Park geun is an old friend. So we want to have uh, keep this both uh, good relationship with, with both Korea. This is my answer. Yeah. OK, thank you. Next, Dr. McKay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. A uh, few comments. Uh, first, uh, Russia and North Korea nuclear program. You know, Russia is responsible nuclear power, and it is absolutely against North Korean nuclear program. So uh, some experts in Russia say that against background of growing Russia-US tension, it could be reasonable for Russia to have nuclear North Korea on the Russian side. But my point of view that uh, such comments are irresponsible and they have nothing common or either with Russian objective security interests or with uh, Russian um, real politic, real policy. Uh, and a Russian influence on North Korea, uh, almost <coughs> zero in, uh, influence if we talk about direct influence. But indirect influence is very interesting. Uh, here I, uh, let me remind that the collapse of the Soviet Union was precondition of the collapse of the Eastern uh, Europe and of East Germany. And collapse of the East German regime was a precondition for German unification. And here it is important that East Germany wasn't a part of unification negotiations with West Germany. The German unification happened as a result of the collapse of the socialist system. It is clear. So, from this point of view, the Russian indirect influence on the situation is that North Korea cannot be a part of unification negotiations. 
North Korean regime does not want unification because they understand that they risk to lose the absolute uh, power. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, it is, uh, unification is not a deal and cannot be a deal between North Korea and South Korea. It will be a result of the collapse of totalitarian North Korean regime. And engagement goal, uh, you remember that America promoted engagement policy towards the Soviet Union. And this engagement policy led to collapse of the Soviet Union, then to collapse uh, of East Germany. Okay, in terms of time, East Germany collapsed before the collapse of the Soviet Union, but when East Germany collapsed, it was clear that Soviet Union didn't have historical chances. Uh, so engagement's goal is not to help North Korean regime to survive. Engagement goal is to help North current North Korean regime to collapse. And this collapse will be a uh, precondition for uh, Korean uh, unification. I agree that for a time being, the situation of two Korean states' peaceful coexistence is, is very probable. And now uh, we have two Korean states. Uh, they do not have official contacts. So they do not have a diplomatic recognition and so on. But from my point of view, if we uh, learn to the lessons of the development of the Soviet Union and of the socialism of the Soviet style, uh, we should um, learn that uh, the system which existed in the Soviet Union and system which exists in North Korea now doesn't have historical future. So in the Soviet Union, uh, the, uh, there are many um, uh, common things in the situation on the eve of the collapse of the Soviet Union and, and nowadays North Korea. The problem is a trigger which will push this political collapse into the practice. In the Soviet Union, a role of the trigger was played by those who tried to make a coup in August 19, 1991. In North Korea, uh, nobody can say now uh, what could be a trigger. That's why nobody can predict when we'll see the collapse of North uh, Korean regime as a precondition for the Korean unification. Thank you. Next. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to associate myself with Vasily's remarks. I think that uh, uh, the goal of engagement with the DPRK is not to convince the DPRK government to engage in negotiations for peaceful unification. It's to help bring about such uh, complete transformations inside North Korea that, in essence, one way or the other, uh, the, the system in the North ceases to exist. Uh, they might choose to do so uh, by their own volition uh, through some sort of a uh, coup or other transformation of leadership, um, or they might uh, dissolve. But one way or the other, uh, it will be a good thing for the, for the world when the North Korean system, as it is currently configured, ceases to exist. Uh, this is uh, a human rights abusing, uh, abysmal government, irresponsible on the world stage, um, and in its current form, uh, uh, offers little of value to anyone. Um, having said that, I, I am not at all optimistic uh, that DPRK will uh, cease to exist anytime soon. Uh, and I think it is folly to predicate our policy on the assumption that they're going to collapse. Uh, the whole point of having a unification strategy and an engagement strategy is to advance the date uh, of North Korea's dissolution. Um, but I think we have to be patient and have a long-term approach. Um, uh, the United States uh, will be very patient over the next two years. Uh, uh, the question, uh, will there be much out of Washington uh, uh, for the last two years? Uh, the answer is no, not much. Um, Washington will be consumed with other issues, and Washington will probably uh, not engage much on North Korea until and unless there is a successful ICBM test, uh, which I don't expect in the next two years. Uh, so I think it will be up to the next U.S. president to uh, uh, think uh, afresh about what kind of an approach to make a North Korea. For the United States to engage North Korea, one of two things must change. Either the leadership of the, of the U.S. government must have a new assessment of the threat, right? Or they must have a new assessment of the opportunity, right? about what can be gained from engagement. And I can tell you that in Washington today, there is a fundamental disinterest and mistrust of negotiations with the DPRK. No one thinks 
that anything much can be accomplished. And there's also a relatively low assessment of the threat. So unless those things change, the next two years will be more of the same. Uh, and finally, I, I, I do want to address Dr. Cotton's very excellent questions about the alliance structure and the East Asian security structure. Uh, I'm not advocating for a NATO for East Asia. Um, I don't think that is practical or, or, or uh, consistent with U.S. security interests. And especially, I don't believe that it's advantageous for the United States to promote security structures in East Asia that are antagonistic to China. Right? Uh, I've been going to China for 30 years. I was a student there in 1984. Uh, and I believe that the U.S. and China uh, must cooperate uh, on the global stage and must cooperate in East Asia. And that the United States security architecture that I describe in my paper, the hub and, sco and spoke architecture, I believe it must be remodeled. Uh, I think it does have Cold War uh, overtones. Uh, and I think it needs to be remodeled uh, so that it is clear that this is not an anti-China security alliance. Um, but I do believe that that hub and spoke architecture is the only one that offers any practical capabilities for the region for the foreseeable future. And with respect to Barry, who I, whose views I agree with when he talks about the importance of, of uh, uh, the future of uh, the Korean Peninsula and, and how uh, China will view it and the U.S. will view it, I, I, I disagree that China has an alliance structure. Uh, Laos, Cambodia, DPRK, Myanmar, and Pakistan, these are not allies for China. These are obligations, liabilities, aid recipients, client states. Uh, they're not allies. They bring no security advantage to, to China uh, of any kind. Um, uh, the U.S. has an alliance structure. ROK, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Thailand, Philippines. Um, uh, it's true that not all of these allies bring a lot of security advantage to the table, but many of them do. Um, and we see in the response to regional calamities, we see in the response to tsunamis and humanitarian problems, we see in the response to nonproliferation and piracy uh, that the U.S. hub and spoke system uh, is the one that matters uh, still for the region and for the foreseeable future. Um, thanks. Okay, be before going into the final round of, of our discussions, I would like to introduce some questions from the floor because I'm now having more than 20 questions. I cannot uh, introduce all of them. I would rather choose more sp specific questions rather than the, a little bit broader questions which cannot be easily answered. The first question, uh, Chairman Kwak Taewon. Uh, in my mind, Korean unification formula would be the neutral, neutralization unification formula might be the best interest of four major powers. What do you think of Korean unification through neutralization? Next, Tong Kim of Korean University, Q. Frank Zanuzi. If President Park press Obama to drop preconditions to resumption of six-party talks, would it work? Another question to Frank Janozzi. Mm. It looks like that the U.S. policy on the issues of North Korean nuclear issues might moving from the denuclearization to the non uh, proliferations. Is it correct that U U.S. decision maker is informally uh, uh, accept the uh, quasi-nuclear status of North Korea? If that is correct, what is the reason for that kind of the changing position? Another one specific question toward John Z regarding how you mentioned the, how DPLK is in search of respect. How do you believe then that the sometimes non-diplomatic means can 
actually increase the possibility of achieving diplomat diplomatic, especially when dealing with North, North Korea. Next couple of questions to the Dr. Lee. Uh, it seems that the North Korean uh, Chinese position toward North Korea a little bit less decisive. Is it because of the uh, lack, uh, lack of influence of the leverage toward North Korea? Or is it because of the lack of the uh, is it because of the capacity to give sanction toward North Korea or is it because of the intention uh, not to give a a uh, awkward uh, situation toward North Korea? And another one question to Dr. Lee, well, it is not yet clear the, what kind of Korean unification formula does the current Xi Jinping uh, leadership is, uh, is, uh, is now supporting. And Yi Suyan at Seoul National University, uh, toward Professor Fujiwara, if you talked about the Japanese position of the indifference, uh, what do you think the major role of the, uh, what do you think the Japanese role for the peace and stability in East Asia as a whole uh, it seems that the Korean issue might be one of the crucial factors for the peace and stability in East Asia as a whole. Uh, there are some other more interesting questions, but because of time limit, I have to stop uh, here, and I would like to invite any uh, speakers or the common okay yes uh, thank you oh you missed oh it's okay Jen. it's okay um back to your original question um about the premise of north korean policy the premise is that there would be no collapse um the, uh, people think about it but it's not included in the premise of the policy about the relative isolation of uh, Japan's approach to North Korea, you're absolutely right, and I agree with you, but uh, that will come with the way things are going. Uh, we are negotiating with North Korea through a middleman. Now, uh, the middleman dislikes any relationship uh, with the United States or Russia or ROK involved in the process, so it is almost by necessity um, um, the bilateral talks would isolate uh, Japan's approach to the region. And to go back to the more basic question um, about the security architecture in the region, um, I would say that yes, um, we do need a security architecture in the region. Um, and the six-party talks uh, does not promise a bright future at the moment. But nevertheless, uh, we need a mechanism that can work in two ways. One is to strengthen the hub and spokes relationship. And, uh, and I don't think I have to tell you that the basic weakness of, a hub and, of the hub and spoke structure right now is between ROK and Japan. Uh, and these are the two countries that, I, I, I dare say that there's responsibility on both sides, but I guess I'm more aware of the shortcoming of the Japanese leadership. Um, but we do have to strengthen the relationship between ROK and Tokyo. Uh, what we call minilaterals. And in the hub and spoke structure, we need stronger connection between American allies, and that is something we need. But strengthening the hub and spoke structure itself would not be sufficient to meet um, the re demands uh, of the rise of China. And, and for that, we need an accommodating structure. And on this, and uh, there was a question about Japan's role. Uh, to put it very bluntly, NPT. Um, Japan, as a nation that has shown great interest in nuclear issues, 
uh, we have also been um, quite um, attentive to the architecture of uh, non-proliferation. And um, this is something we don't have in the East, East Asian region. Um, this, um, this summer in Hiroshima, uh, we had a meeting with, with um, Korean, Chinese, American delegates, along with Japanese delegates, about the possibility of arms control and nuclear um, non-proliferation in the East Asian region. Uh, the reason I bring this up is because arm control essentially was about Russia and the United States. And very little has been done on the East Asian region with this um, pressure against uh, DPRK as a sole exception. We need an architecture. By arms control, I, don't, I do not mean abolishment of all nuclear weapons. That's not the point. The point is about confidence building, about, trans about um, transparency, and also a regime that can de-escalate potential conflicts. Uh, so that, well, um, we can hope that a potential conflict between um, Japan and China, for one, would not develop into a major scale war. I'll end here. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the, uh, the yeah. excellent questions. Uh, in the deference of time, I'll just give very short answers, uh, inadequate answers. Um, if the ROK were to change its approach to resuming negotiations with, with the North Korea, would Obama uh, agree to reduce the, the uh, requirements on the North? I think the short answer to that is yes. Um, there could be flexibility on the part of the United States if South Korea leads. Uh, I think uh, the United States will follow. Um, but I think there is no retreat uh, and can be no retreat from the objective of denuclearization. Um, th this is not something on which any U.S. president can show flexibility. Um, Non-proliferation is an important near-term, near-term objective, because the, the immediate threat from the North Korean nuclear arsenal is not so much that they would use their weapons, it's that, it's that they would export their capability and technology or fissile material to third parties as they did with Syria. Um, but the ultimate objective would remain uh, denuclearization. Um, and the United States is not prepared, either rhetorically or as a matter of policy, to accept the DPRK as a nuclear state. Um, I think showing respect for the DPRK can take many forms. I think most fundamentally it could take the form of establishing uh, representative diplomatic offices. Uh, uh, Lee Hong-gu reminded us of how close we were to that 20 years ago. Um, and there are only uh, four or five nations in the world with whom the United States does not maintain diplomatic relations. Uh, Iran, Cuba, Bhutan, and North Korea. Uh, Bhutan, by their own choice. Uh, Iran and Cuba, uh, as a consequence of international incidents. And North Korea, um, all right, that's a, uh, it's an odd situation, especially with the U.S. Uh, NATO allies having diplomatic relations with North Korea. Why we have no diplomatic contact is a sign of disrespect. Maybe that's some respect that we could show them, perhaps. And, and uh, finally, just um, on the future of a unified Korea, it will be up to the Korean people to decide whether or not they want to remain a U.S. treaty ally uh, after unification. It will not be a negotiation with any third parties. Um, I do believe that the United States and Korea will be cognizant of China's equities with respect to any alliance structure that the U.S. and the people of Korea would choose to perpetuate after unification. Uh, but it will not be a negotiation that takes place in Beijing. It, it will be a negotiation between the people of Korea and the people of the United States. Dr. Lee, would you respond briefly to the questions? interesting phenomenon that the people outside China think uh, China has huge influence uh, with DPRK, but China inside, we believe we don't have that influence with DPR DPRK. I think this is a really big gap. Uh, actually, I think China's influence on DPRK depends on a lot of factors. The main factor is how DPRK review, uh, view China, how DPRK view China's uh, influence. And uh, if DPRK never think, uh, don't believe, doesn't believe uh, ch a relationship with China is a tough issue, then China's influence is, will be diminished. So I think uh, for my, 
from my personal thinking, uh, uh, in DPRK, they still believe the relationship with the United States is the is this top issue. Yes, this is my answer. Do you leave some final words? <coughs> Just a short comment on the question about neutralized neutral uh, neutralization uh, neutralized uh, United Korea. Uh, I think that if uh, Korea unification happens in short run or in medium term run, uh, it is unlikely. The problem is that against background of uh, the current stage of Russia-America relations because of the Ukrainian uh, crisis, Americans uh, more likely will try to prolong U.S.-South Korea alliance against possible Russian threat as uh, Washington perceives it now. This will go farther in the second sessions right after the short break. I think that the uh, four speakers and three discussions uh, did have an excellent job and gave us a, a good chances for us, for us to think about once more the complexity of the emerging structures in this arena and also the meaning of the unification and the new situation. Thank you very much for presentation and Thank comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great job. Thank you.